Thank you. Hi. Um, so just need to make a clarification about my talk. I'm going to be using purposely ambiguous language throughout this. I'm going to be saying things like where I work and at my job. I don't work at some secret, secret agency around here. Uh, I just didn't want to put a disclaimer slide, and I don't like it when people use their talks to advertise their company. So also, this is work that I do outside of uh, my work on my own time. So my talk today is going to be uh, partially about advocating for more people giving more security training and more venues on more topics. And it's also going to be about uh, advertising OpenSecurityTraining.info, which is a resource for people who want to become instructors to take uh, material that's already posted there and uh, just reuse it and go do their own training, you know, get paid to get this training elsewhere. And so uh, first I want to give a little bit of uh, introduction in terms of the origin of Open Security Training and what was the motivation for actually making it. Uh, and so basically it started uh, three years ago when I started working on a trusted computing uh, project at my work. And in order to do this particular project, it required a variety of uh, in-depth skills, things like x86 assembly, reading, writing, and debugging, things like OS internals, memory management, you know, how page tables are laid out, uh, how the Windows P binary format works, and how stealth malware and uh, rootkits are generally put together. So uh, we needed these skills in people. These are sort of skills that are in short supply. And we needed people who had these in order to even work on the project. And beyond that, uh, we needed to be able to convey some of this type of knowledge to the people who would eventually be using the, the project in order to have them understand what the point of it was, because we don't want to just give them some tool and not have them understand what it's trying to tell them. Uh, so I was very incentivized to, to generate some internal training to teach people for the project and teach people who would be using the project. And I was much more incentivized by the fact that where I work has a uh, $1,250 per day training incentive program. So we have to have a minimum of two days of training and then we teach it two different sites. So we're talking about $5,000 for a single class uh, with our internal training. And so that was obviously a very good motivation to have me start generating some classes. Uh, and so once I started generating these classes, things like x assembly, you can see how they would be useful as prerequisites for further classes. So if we want people to learn more about the internals of exploits, if they take the x86 class first, and then they can focus just on the exploits instead of having an instructor have to try to cram everything into one class. So things like exploits and reverse engineering and so forth, recognize that these initial core set of classes could be uh, used to bootstrap further classes. So I started visualizing, you know, what can we actually do with these classes and what sort of, you know, in-demand skill sets can we help uh, encourage the development of. Uh, and I started visualizing it basically like a, um, like in video games and role-playing games where you have a skill tree that you level up your character. Well, it's the same sort of thing. And for, for the particular areas that I'm working in, uh, it looks something like this. So we have you know, this initial core set of classes that were to serve my own purposes, but then we have further classes beyond that uh, in things like reverse engineering where we need more people, but you know, obviously you can't just go pick up lots of reverse engineers, it's in high demand. Uh, and so, so while it's all good and well that we have these sort of training that you know, serves my purposes to help get people on my project, and you know, it serves other people's purposes. And, and while it's very good that you know, I can give myself a $25,000 bonus by teaching a bunch of classes internally, uh, there was this other issue that was, you know, I have this nagging voice in the back of my mind that I'm not going to be doing this project forever, and I'm not going to be at my same workplace forever. So I wanted to have some way to pass this training on and give it to people when I eventually decide that you know, I no longer want to give it. So there's sort of a problem of succession. I have to be able to pick someone that I can say, you know, when I'm done with this class, I'll give the class to you and you can do it. And obviously having an incentive program that pays people for doing internal training makes this an easy sell on, on their part. If I just, you know, spend 100 hours in order to build a training class and then I hand it to you and I say, go ahead and just, you know, take two days and teach this and you get $5,000, well, they're, they're obviously going to pick it up and use it, right? So, the only problem remaining here is that if I give it to the wrong person, then they could, you know, keep it to themselves and eventually someone down the line can drop the ball and make it so that although there's this 
this material that I'm giving out to you know subsequent instructors that I really want them to teach, you know, so that this sort of information can continue to be taught internally, even if I go off elsewhere. Um, if I don't give it to the right people and they drop the ball, then then that's a problem because you know that that's wasted money. Okay. Um, and so I'm not the kind of person who can pick up my train of thought. So basically, I needed to be able to give the material to many different people. And uh, the solution here is to make it open source material. Basically, use a Creative Commons license and say, I'm going to give it to many potential instructors. There's many different people who can know this material. And then they can fight it, fight it out amongst themselves to figure out who's going to actually get paid in order to train in the future. And so if I'm going to give it to many people internally, I may as well give it to many people externally as well. So this is sort of the genesis of the idea of open security training that info. I'm already making this material widely available. If it's useful for us to train people, it's going to be useful to, to you to train people as well. And if you already know the same stuff as I do, which you know, every time someone gets up here on stage, there's always plenty of people out in the audience who already know all the same stuff and oftentimes know it better. So I'm sure plenty of you know all these sort of topics. And we wanted to make it be the case that I can give you this material and you can just pick it up and start doing training internally uh, for a variety of reasons. So that was sort of the idea which led to open security training. So one year ago I registered the website and I started putting my material up there and other people's material up there for free. But we didn't actually start publicizing it until last December because we wanted to wait for a couple of initial uh, criteria to be met first. First, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't just my material. I wanted to make sure there was show that you know I have other colleagues who think this is a good idea and are, are willing to put their material up because this is really sort of a this is not me going out there and saying wouldn't it just be nice if we all got along and shared our material and, and let's have some you know, free look here. Uh, the point is it's put up or shut up and all of us are putting up our material and we're saying we think it's very important that. Uh, we give this material out there so that other people can distribute it and, and do their own internal training. So uh, then the other, the other issue here is one of, uh, well, this is the same issue of, of knowledge transfer. And there's a um, <clears throat> metaphor which I had thought of at the time that I was putting this in, so when, that I was putting the talk in for submission. So I'm going to have to elaborate on why I was saying about it. Um, so this is Alice and Eve. These are the progenitors of all security knowledge, an attacker and a good guy. Uh, and so in the beginning, there's just the core truth of there's attack and there's defense. And so over time, Alice and Eve uh, generate more and more security knowledge until we finally have the basics. This is the things like confidentiality, integrity, availability, and unrepudiation, authentication, and what have you. And so the thing is, the basics is where I think a lot of education, especially at the college level, is stalled. You have crypto classes, you have computer security 101, but you know, over time, we've these people have just continued to generate more and more knowledge as more and more people get into the thing, get into computer security. And so, you know, computer uh, college curriculum has not at all obviously uh, caught up with you know where things are at. There's plenty of you know paid training for one area or another, but paid training often doesn't adequately convey things in a uh, in a structured uh, manner uh, where you take this and you take that and you take that and you have the minimal path to get the knowledge that you need. And so, you know, the, the information, compu the computer security uh, train, uh, knowledge necessary just keeps growing. That's why we have increasing specialization of people, you know, you know RFID and you know reverse engineering and you know NetFlows and so forth. And so that's what the, the situation looks like today. We just have a ton of knowledge. And so, the question that organizations have is, if you need a bunch of people who have some particular skill set, how are you actually going to get them? And how that's generally done today is that you let people random walk their way up the pyramid, figuring, you know, looking at that and saying, oh, that's interesting, I'll go that way, and then go that way, that's interesting as well. And so people random walk their way up this knowledge set, and then people try to scoop up, you know, organizations try to scoop up whoever happens to come up with the particular knowledge which they're needing. But, you know, obviously that doesn't work very well because you can have very niche skill sets which, you know, there's not going to be a lot of people ending up there. So, you know, if your organization knows that you need a bunch of that information, people knowing that information, and you know that here's all the prerequisite information, 
uh, that will get you there, then the question is, what are you going to do about that, right? You may know that they need to know, you know, hundreds of things in order to be an effective reverse engineer, but, you know, what are you going to do? Just dump a bunch of text files on them and say, read those and come work for me once you're done with that? Uh, so, I think the much more efficient way to go about this is to, you know, strategically place people along this pyramid of knowledge where those people can guide uh, and help people to show them, you know, here's where you're going, this is the knowledge which I'm actually giving you now, but you're going here, you're going there. And, and the important thing, the, the, where the pyramid element of it comes in is just the notion that, uh, you know, there's lots of people who can teach computer security 101, and, you know, there's fewer people who can teach network security 101, and there's fewer people who can teach, you know, x86 assembly and so forth. So you have, in order to actually grow the skill base, you need to be bringing in a lot of people. Some of them are going to settle out at the bottom layers, some of them are going to keep going up, and so forth, right? So obviously, you know, it's the self-directed learners who are, who are the ones who ultimately create the new blocks of knowledge. It's the people who are interested in creatively exploring it. They're the ones growing it, but you need to be able to, to get people in and get them the baseline level of knowledge so that they can figure everything out, so they can see whatever the new stuff is that they need to find. So this can only really happen if we significantly lower the bar in terms of what it takes to become an instructor. And so, so that's sort of the idea with Open Security Training at Info. We're taking material that's being licensed Creative Commons or some other open license, and we're saying, you know, we're giving this out, and you can uh, take this training and give it in any venue that uh, that you can find, essentially. So there's a couple different reasons why you should uh, give. Uh, why you should teach and why you should contribute material. And there's definitely both selfish and altruistic reasons, and it doesn't really matter what appeals to you more. But you know, I'll tell you that it was the selfish reasons which really got me off my butt and made me start doing some of this. But then it's you know, nice to have altruistic reasons that you can hold up for management or whoever. So uh, in case you didn't notice, uh, computer security training is big business. There's lots of places that offer training, lots of conferences which offer training. So there's plenty of opportunity to make money. It helps if you're famous, so keep that in mind. But, uh, but you know, definitely, you know, becoming an adjunct faculty at colleges, giving training internally, getting them to offer internal training programs uh, is a way to make money. And so obviously you can look good inside and outside work when you're showing what you know. If you're someone who's already developed a a very specialized skill set, you know, there's a lot of information which you may have which you're not necessarily making use of all the time and, and giving that to other people and then also showing people that you have this knowledge definitely makes you look good. But, you know, if you really want to look like a go-getter at your organization, if you don't have internal training already, uh, proposing that is a really good way to uh, look good and then potentially make money because there's a very easy math that uh, makes it obviously better to use internal training than external training. You know, if you're if you send five people to two thousand dollars of pop training, you know that's five people in your organization who for ten thousand uh, dollars. If you get internal training for five thousand dollars, one instructor can teach twenty people. So, you know, you've quadrupled the efficiency of what uh, of of the actual spending of money and and getting people to have knowledge. Um, <coughs> And, and there's other, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefits, and I don't want to dwell too long on any particular one. Um, then, in terms of the altruistic reasons why you should teach, there's, uh, when I first started promoting this back in December, uh, I led with the notion of, you didn't learn everything yourself, people helped you, and maybe you should help other people out. And unfortunately, well, interestingly, I'll say, uh, some people bristled at this notion. They, they really thought that they figured out everything by themselves. And, you know, unless you figured out everything starting at voltage fluctuation equals binary code equals, you know, transistors are used for this and that. Unless you really start at that physics level, and unless you figure the physics out yourself, you obviously didn't learn everything yourself. So people put text files out there all the time. You know, whether it's for altruistic reasons or selfish reasons, whether it's because they want people to know the same stuff that they know, or whether it's because, you know, they just want to have a reputation and increase it, right? 
So, you know, that's a good reason to teach, basically, to, to convey your knowledge that you've really gotten from other people. And, and that's another sort of issue I have with a lot of paid training. You know, you're paying thousands of dollars for information where the instructors are really just bringing together things which are in the open literature. And they're just saying, you know, in my estimation, this is the important stuff that you need to know. In a perfect world, uh, what would happen is, by using open security training, yeah, thank you, thank you, because when I say a perfect world, you should definitely shoot all that. Ideally, whatever you want to say, um, if we take, basically the point is, I don't think that anyone should be getting paid $2,000 to teach introduction to exploits, you know, really basic classes. So if we put an introduction to exploits class out there for free, and you know what a buffer overflow is, and you know what a heap corruption is, you should be able to take that class and you know, start getting paid to train it in whatever venues you can find. And basically the point would be to dramatically increase the supply here so that we have many different people teaching this in as many venues as possible, pushing down the price and specifically motivating people to go beyond that so that, you know, so that it can just be expected that you know, for 100, 200 bucks you can have an introductory ex exploits class and then that motivates people that if the money's not there anymore, maybe they should start teaching the advanced techniques. Uh, you know, obviously, this will uh, this reduces the inefficiency that we currently see. You know, when you're bringing in people from college level, whether they're undergrad or masters, quite frankly, a lot of people don't really have the skills that you need in order to utilize them effectively. Uh, so having training programs really can can accelerate. Uh, getting them the skills that you need to have them have. Uh, and then also, I think the big one, one of the big ones for me is being able to get peers faster. So on the previous slide, you know, I, I didn't highlight it, but some people like to have underlings, some people like to have people that they can clearly say, you know, I know more than you and you should keep asking me for knowledge. And some people just want to get the other smart people who would be able to figure out all the same stuff that they know anyways. Uh, and get them up to their level so that those people can then collaborate and go off and do their own stuff so that they'll learn some new knowledge and then they'll, they'll tell it back to you. So I think, you know, it's, that's really one of the things I'm interested in. I just want to get people to know all the same stuff I know in a much shorter period of time and then they can go out and start generating new information and, and that's the kind of thing which actually pushes the field forward because I'm much more interested in, in what the end game looks like than and this miscellaneous slow progression that we have right now. Uh, why should you actually contribute your material to Open Security Training that info? Well, one selfish reason would be. To, oh, lost me. Oh, five minutes. Over. This only says I've been talking for 17 minutes. We started like really late. Okay. Uh, anyways, a selfish reason why uh, you should. Uh, contributing material is, you know, if you if you've got your exploits class and you think the exploits class we've already got up there is shit, well, prove it. You know, put your material up there and show that you know you organize your stuff better, you cover more advanced exploits or whatever it is. But you know, you can show that you know your training is better and that increases your reputation. Saying this person really knows what they're talking about, and this person over here, they're an amateur. Right. Uh, so, and I, I kind of think that, you know, the least I can do, if, if you're going to be contributing your material to let other people use it, the least I can do is let you use your page on securitytraining.info to advertise the fact that you can give the training. Because, obviously, not every organization has people who can just pick this up and start using it internally to train other people. So, you can say that, you know, hey, I've got this material that I teach. You can take it and teach it internally. Or, if you don't have any people who know this material, then go ahead and uh, go ahead and pay me to train it for you. Right. Uh, in terms of the altruistic reasons to uh, contribute to the site, uh, there's definitely an issue of duplication of effort out there right now. There's there's lots of people who have hacking 101 classes, and really, you know, there's lots of people who then spend more time to generate more of those classes, especially at the baseline, you know, introduction to computer security and things like that. Uh, it's really stupid that people will you know, continue to generate these materials. If you just put one class out there, then anyone who would have spent time making an introduction to security can just go ahead and take years and start, uh, start training it. 
Another interesting thing is that I've noticed that if you look at the class schedules for things like Black Hat, and you look at Black Hat training, there's plenty of classes where people have taught it in the past, but they don't teach it anymore. Uh, and so that could be for a number of reasons. It could be uh, because uh, it could be because it's obsolete and they just didn't feel like updating the material. It could be because there was a lack of interest and so forth. But whether it's lack of interest or the material is obsolete, still by, by putting it out there and making it available for future instructors, you know, even if only for a historical you know, point, pulling out your old slides and saying, you know, this is what the state of the art used to be, that's still going to be useful for instructors generating new classes. And uh, sort of like I was talking about before, until we get lots and lots of people training the baseline stuff, we're going to be just stuck with certificates and certifications like we have right now. You really need lots of instructors teaching classes to the point where it becomes so cheap that they're, they're motivated to start teaching the higher level classes uh, before you really raise the baseline knowledge for security people. Uh, so with that, hold, uh, hold applause. I'm not done. Questions? All right, well, that wasn't a question, obviously. That was more of a statement. But he did say up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, start. And that obviously enabled the extra content here. So there's only one other little idea that I want to put into your head before you go today. And that's the notion that some security knowledge just requires grinding in the video game sense of grinding, right? So uh, I think particularly of things like reverse engineering. You really have to just look at code over and over and over again until you know assembly instructions become letters that turn into words, become words that turn into paragraphs, and so forth. Some of this really requires repetitive effort, and that's why it takes so long to, for people to eventually become trained up in these areas. So I think that can be really accelerated by taking some uh, particular, using some game elements, and just trying to reinforce something. Another element is that in my classes, they've been spread out over a number of months, and so people will tend to forget things if they're not actually working in the area that you're trying to train them up on. You know, so if you're eventually trying to learn rootkits and you learn x86, you know, one and a half years before you actually take the rootkits class, it's pretty good. At, it's a pretty good bet that you're going to forget the stuff by the time you get there. So uh, this is a good way to reinforce the things, and it's also a good way to just uh, make it a little more fun to actually. So with that, I want to show a really quick uh, example of, of uh, one of the games that I've uh, developed. So Rockstar Arcade is this, uh, this Google uh, code repository where so Rockstar Arcade is Google code repository, and I really wanted to hear from other people in terms of their ideas for new games. Basically. For your particular area, you know, whether it's networking or physical hardware reversing and so forth, think about what sort of things could you do that would actually reinforce and teach people about your area while still making it you know, at least a little bit fun. So uh, the one that I'm going to show today is uh, called the other ESP game. And this is supposed to teach about use of the stack in x86 assembly. So it's kind of the, using the stack is a very big thing. You can't understand you know, buffer overflows unless you understand the stack. Uh, and you know you can't reverse engineer code if you don't know what they're doing with putting information on and off the stack. You need to know fillable variables and parameters passed to functions and so forth. So in this uh, single game, we, uh, we basically are given a uh, hex word that we need to find on the stack. So here it's Kabbalah. And and find it right there. And so there's different ways that I can represent that value. I can represent it as EVP relative or ESP relative. And so in the game, I can either say, okay, well, the ball is ESP plus zero, or I can say it's EVP minus 4, 8, 16, 20, 24. So uh, there's different options. I can say EVP, EVP minus 24, or minus 23, it's, it's the 4, Check for about here. 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. Okay. So I can say EVP minus 20, A5, or I could have said the other uh, option, ESP plus 0. And so, you know, this is very, very simple. And that's the key point here is that you need to make the games very simple to start with, to reinforce it until they, until they get it, and then you can start advancing from there. So, as the, the previous talk just said, cheating is fundamental. So I'm going to 
enable my secret war course which is in here, and uh, we can skip to further levels. And uh, in this level, PvP and ESP are no longer all at the same level. So I can, you know, randomly go through things. Much time. Good. How much? Yeah. Okay. Randomly go through things, and uh, and in this level, the low addresses are sometimes high, and the high addresses are sometimes low. So forth. So that randomizes it. In this level, we have left and right, up and down.